Good afternoon to our East Coast Central Time and Mountain Time attendees. And good morning to our West Coast attendees. Magandang hapon at magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. We are joined again today by the Ambassador Claro Cristobal of the Philippine Consulate General in New York. He will say a few words later. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you all for joining us online on this second Filipino-American Health Forum on COVID-19. The first forum last Saturday was on epidemiology of COVID-19 by Dr. Francis C. and viewed by over 4,400 people, even as far as the Philippines, and recorded at the consulate's Facebook page. If you want to view the presentation, the link should be on the invitation and the event bright page, and also available on the Philippine consulate Facebook page. So back to today's event, there, there are two presentations. The first presentation will be on pathology and pathogenesis of COVID-19. The second presentation will be on infection control and prevention of COVID-19. We are live streaming and there are many of you participating on Blue Jeans and also on Facebook Live on the Philippine Consulate General in New York Facebook page. Please share the consulate Facebook page on your networks. And to our Kababayans who are not able to join us on Blue Jeans, this event is also being recorded for future reference and presentation. I'm Dr. Romel Rivera, the president of the Association of Philippine Physicians in America, APPA or APA for short, one of the organizers of the Philippine American Health Forum. I will be your MC today. The Philippine American Health Forums are very much in line with the mission of APPA, which is to educate, empower, and advocate for Philippine American physicians and their communities. As was mentioned by the Consul General last week, one out of five nurses is a Filipino. Thus, there's a high likelihood that there's a Filipino nurse right now in the front lines battling the COVID-19 pandemic. There are also many Filipino American doctors, healthcare workers on the front lines and sidelines, um, and many Filipino Americans that are quarantined uh, in their homes and traveled by anxiety and stress. The organizers of the Health Forum bring you Filipino American expertise and Filipino American excellence through the invited Filipino American experts to empower and advocate for our Filipino American community. Because a very informed community is an empowered community. We believe that when a Filipino American talks to a Filipino American, it strikes a different code, chord. At this time, I will ask my co-organizers and panelists to say a few words. The first is Dr. Marie Ortaliz, the president of the Philippine Nurses Association of New York. Dr. Marie. My name is Dr. Marie Ortaliz, president of the Philippine Nurses Association of New York. Community outreach is one of the roles we play in the community in order to provide evidence-based practice to everyone in order for them to live a happy and healthy life. Today, we are going to present education again on prevention and control, and of course, also on the effects of the virus, of the coronavirus in the, body, in the human body. So we hope that this webinar will enlighten you on facts that you need to know. The next presenter or the next organizer is Dr. Emerson Ia, Chair of Kalusugan Coalition. Thank you, Dr. Ortelis. As a community organization dedicated to advancing the health and well-being of Filipino Americans, Kalosugan Coalition is very proud to co-organize and co-host this health forum series on COVID-19. This pandemic has touched every one of us, and this health forum is our way to inform and empower the Filipino American community by discussing topics that resonate with and address the needs of our community. We thank you for your participation, and we look forward to a robust and engaging dialogue during our Q&A session. 
It is now my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Laura Garcia, the chair of the National Federation of Filipino American Associations, NAFA, New York chapter. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Hi, my name is Laura Garcia. I am the state chair for the National Federation of Filipino American Associations of New York, or NAFA New York. NAFA's mission is to promote the welfare and well-being of Filipino Americans throughout the United States by amplifying their voices, advocating on behalf of their interests, and providing resources to facilitate their empowerment. Some of our advocacies include promoting collaboration on issues affecting Filipino Americans in areas of education, health, civil rights, immigration, and many others. NAFA partners with local affiliate organizations and national coalitions in advocating for issues common, of common concern. Health is a common concern, especially in our current environment of COVID-19. With you in mind, this Philam Health Forum was designed. So welcome to the second of several series of the Philam Health Forum. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Angelica Razan. Dr. Razan is the committee co-chair of the Council for Young Filipino American Physicians of the Association of Philippine Physicians in America. Hello to everyone joining us from web camera, telephone, and live stream. Uh, my name is Angelica Razan, or ECO for short, and I'm calling from Philadelphia. Uh, Antonio Moya and uh, from Los Angeles and I are the co-chairs of the Council of Young Filipino American Physicians, or CFAP. As a part of APPA, CFAP's mission is to provide a professional and social platform for the leadership development of young Filipino American physicians trainee, and trainees, and to promote the educational pipeline and partner with Filipino American community to eliminate health disparities. Our vision is to embolden leaders to amplify the voice of our members, patients, and communities. We will unify the diverse lived experiences of young Filipino American physician uh, community and inspire every Filipino American medical student, trainee, and physician to be an effective change agent in tackling the community's most pressing health priorities. We are enthusiastic to be collaborating with other Philam organizations on this series. Now, Dr. Rivera will introduce our next speaker. At this time, I am very privileged and honored to present to you the Philippine Consul General in New York, the Ambassador Claro Cristobal, who is our partner and a great supporter of the Philippine American Health Forum. Ambassador. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Romel, and uh, good afternoon and good morning also to uh, everyone watching and participating in this uh, health forum. I am so pleased to report to you that beyond the 4,000 who uh, participated last Saturday in, uh, directly in our first health forum, there were in fact 18,000 who received uh, the, the transmission we, we sent uh, through our Facebook uh, page. More than 18,000 were rich as far as Spain. And wow. it is uh, my message to us all this afternoon. We are really getting battered by this pandemic. As a community, and particularly yourselves as frontliners. So my deepest gratitude goes to all of you for uh, this wonderful project that we have to educate, to inform our people so that they may be empowered uh, to face and defeat the virus. People all over the world are suffering, but we as a community of frontliners, of those right there where the big battles are fought, are getting impacted even more harshly. The green statistic is really sad. As of yesterday, 
75 of our people in the Northeast uh, fell uh, to this virus. And 28, 28 out of those 75 were frontliners like yourselves. So thank you so much and we welcome everyone in the world to this second health forum by our great partners, the Association of Physici Filipino Physicians in America, the Philippine Nurses Association in New York, the K Kalusugan Coalition, and NAFA, the National Federation of Filipino Associations in America. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I would like to introduce to you at this time the expert speakers for this series. We have two uh, presenters, as I mentioned. The first one is Dr. Angelberta Santos. I'm sorry, <laughs> Angelberta, or Angie for short. Uh, she's my classmate, actually. Angelberta Santos, MD, internal medicine and pulmonary specialist. She received her bachelor's of pre-med degree from the University of the Philippines and her doctor of medicine degree from the University of the East, Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center, College of Medicine. She pursued her internal medicine residency and training at the Metropolitan Hospital Center in New York and pulmonary medicine fellowship training at the New York Medical College. She is currently an attending physician at the Flushing Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Angie Santos. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Angie Santos, and I will give a short talk on COVID-19 pathogenesis and pathology. A novel coronavirus designated by the World Health Organization as COVID-19 was identified as the cause of a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China at the end of 2019. The coronavirus is a beta corona, the COVID-19 virus is a beta coronavirus in the same class as the SARS or the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus that occurred in China in 2003. Coronaviruses are large positive stranded RNA viruses with a crown-like appearance under an electron microscope to the presence of spike glycoprotein on the envelope. Its major structural proteins are the S or the spike protein, the M membrane protein, the E or the envelope protein, and the N or the nucleocapsid protein, which has its genetic material. This is a simplified representation of the viral life cycle and replication of COVID-19. The virus targets or enter the lung cell through its spike protein S that binds to the receptor called the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor in the lungs. Following receptor binding, the virus enters the cell releases its genetic material, and after a series of steps, new viral particles are formed and subsequently released, and these viral life cycle steps provide potential targets for drug therapy. How does the human or host cell react when the virus enters the cell? Humans have specific HLAs, or human leukocyte antigens, which are proteins on the surface of white blood cells and which plays a central part of the body's antiviral immunity. Studies in the past for the SARS coronavirus show different types of HLAs, which correlated to susceptibility to the virus and other types which afforded protection. To date, we don't have an understanding yet for specific HLAs against COVID-19. Antigen presentation from the virus 
it stimulates the body's humoral and cellular immunity. The SARS coronavirus has a typical pattern of IgM antibody, which disappears at the end of week 12, and IgG antibody, which can last a longer time. This is similar to the common colds. At present, we still do not have enough data on humoral immunity for COVID-19. In contrast, we have more data on cellular immunity. Reports showed that the number of the CD4 T helper cells and CD8 T killer cells in the blood of infected COVID-19 patients is significantly reduced, but in a state of excessive activation. This is the same finding among SARS coronavirus patients from 2003, and significantly, memory cells, which are CD4 T helper cells, have persisted for four to six years in recovered individuals. Again, this is the SARS coronavirus patients from 2003. This finding may provide valuable information in the rational design of vaccines against COVID-19. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, is the main cause of death of COVID-19. One of the main mechanisms for ARDS is a cytokine storm, the deadly, uncontrollable, systemic inflammatory response due to the release of large amounts of pro-inflammatory cytokines, interferon alpha, interferon gamma, intraleukin-1b, intraleukin-6, and other chemokines. The cytokine storm will trigger a violent attack by the immune system to the body, causing ARDS, multiple organ failure, and finally death in severe cases. It is hypothesized that the coronavirus can evade the host immune system in three different ways, by actively producing interferon antagonist protein, by using its own proteins to modify the host proteins, and by forming double membranes to hide its genetic material from the RNA sensing machinery of the host cell. Theoretically, destroying this means of evasion would be an inspiration in its treatment and specific drug development. Stages of infection. The stage one is the asymptomatic state, which is the, the initial one to two days of infection. The inhaled virus likely binds to the epithelial cells in the nasal cavity and starts replicating. At this stage, the virus can be detected by nasal swab using RT-PCR. That stands for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, which measures the amount of specific viral RNA. Although the viral burden may be low, these individuals are contagious. Stage two, would be the upper airway and conducting airway response, which would be the next few days. The virus propagates and migrates down the respiratory tract along the conducting airways, and a more robust immune response is triggered, manifested by fever, cough, malaise, myalgias, headaches, and at this time, the disease is clinically manifest. In about 80% of patients, the disease will be mild and mostly restricted to the upper and conducting airways. These individuals may be maintained at home with conservative symptomatic therapy. Stage three will be hypoxia, ground glass of infiltrates, and progression to ARDS. About 20% of infected patients will progress to stage three disease and will develop pulmonary infiltrates, and some of them will develop severe disease. The virus now invades the gas exchange units of the lungs and infects the alveolar cells. The lung involvement tends to be peripheral and subplural. The virus multiplies within the alveolar cells, large numbers of virus particles are released, and the alveolar cells die. What are the pathological findings in COVID-19? Macroscopic features are likely to be in the chest and may include pleurisy, pericarditis, pneumonia, and pulmonary edema. A secondary bacterial infection may be superimposed as well. Microscopic features, 
Findings may range from nonspecific to include lung edema, numerous site hyperplasia, focal inflammation, and multinucleated giant cell formation to diffuse alveolar damage and hyaline membrane formation. The inflammation is predominantly lymphocytic. There are cases of severe COVID-19 pneumonia which exhibited features of systemic hyperinflammation or cytokine storm, also known as MAS or macrophage activation syndrome or secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis. These are associated with highly elevated C-reactive protein, elevated ferritin, coagulopathy with elevated D-dimers and abnormal liver function. This emerging COVID-19 immunopathology could be associated with extensive pulmonary microthrombosis. Multiple organs are involved in COVID-19, fulminant cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, acute myocardial infarction due to hypoxemia with or without coronary artery disease, and cardiac arrhythmias have been reported. Liver involvement showed microvesicular steatosis and damage to intrahepatic bile ducts. Plasma cells and lymphocytes with interstitial edema in the lamina propria of the stomach, duodenum, and rectum were found on endoscopic biopsies. Acute injury to the kidneys may be due to direct viral attack, cytokine storm with reduction in blood flow to the kidneys, or there could be secondary kidney damage due to mechanical ventilation or antiviral therapies. Pre-existing conditions like diabetes and hypertension can increase chances of kidney injury. Hematologic, endothelial damage of blood vessels, mimicking vasculitis may be because of direct injury of the virus to the endothelial cells, leading to DIC or disseminate intravascular coagulation. COVID-19 has been associated with co coagulopathy with elevated D-dimers, elevated fibrinogen levels causing multiple blood clots leading to disseminated intravascular coagulation. The skin is also involved in the form of rashes or hives and in the form of levido reticularis, which are red or purplish discoloration due to blood clotting abnormalities as seen in the toes, called COVID toes, but may be seen in the fingers as well. Eye involvement may include conjunctivitis, photophobia, irritation, and ocular discharge. The brain and the central nervous system is also involved in COVID-19, maybe because of direct viral injury, similar to herpes simplex encephalitis, maybe because of injury from the cytokine storm, as in acute necrotizing encephalitis. Guillain-Barre syndrome has been reported, but there's weak evidence for cause and effect. There is a loss of sense of smell and, and taste because of possible invasion through the nose and then upward and through the olfactory bulb. Possibly also, the infection depresses the brainstem reflex that senses oxygen starvation. And this is a possible explanation for anecdotal observation that some patients aren't gasping for air despite dangerously low blood oxygen levels. And of course, indirect viral injury on the brain from the effects of systemic illness such as encephalopathy, myopathy, and neuropathy. Symptoms include headaches, confusion, loss of consciousness, tissues, and strokes. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Dr. Santos. Before we proceed, um, I'd like to call on Dr. Razon to, um, to tell us about medical uh, disclaimers um, and uh, housekeeping rules. Dr. Razon. Thank you, Dr. Santos and Dr. Rivera. Uh, I, I do wanna call everyone's attention to the chat box um, at this moment. I have posted some, some guidelines for the rest of our conversation today. Um, so please uh, take this moment to find the chat box if you're joining us on web camera uh, or on your tablet or phone. 
So just as a reminder, uh, this event is being recorded so that it can be shared later with others uh, not able to join at the live event. Uh, and you can check the chat box for the link, um, uh, as well as for the YouTube channel and as the RSVP for the next event. Uh, just as a reminder, when viewing virtual events, uh, please be in a quiet location and uh, mute your audio when you're not speaking so that others may enjoy the presentation. Uh, more importantly, if you have questions for Dr. Santos or Barroso um, after their initial presentations, please use this chat box on the side. Uh, don't forget to introduce yourself with your name and your state. Uh, Dr. Ia will be monitoring the chat box for questions and comments. Um, our goal of this series is to build community and share information. We are unable to comment on an individual's risk factors or medical issues. So if you or a loved one is having a medical concern, please seek attention from your healthcare provider. Um, this is an evolving phenomenon and every locality's public health um, situation is different. So please refer to the cdc.gov or coronavirus.gov and your local department of public health for the most up-to-date information. Again, these links are being shared in the chat box. Uh, I will now turn it back to Dr. Rivera to continue with the rest of our program. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Razon. Uh, now we are equally pleased to have with us today Dr. L.B. Barroso, PhD, MD, M MSC, uh, MSN, and RN, who is a professional development coordinator for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Barroso had received the following degrees, MD uh, from the La Salle University in the Philippines, Master of Science in Occupational Medicine at the National University in Singapore, Diploma in Epidemiology and Tuberculosis Control at Research Institute of Tuberculosis in Japan, bachelor, Bachelor's and Master's Degree in Public Health, and Master of Science Degree in Nursing and Specialization in Community Public Health uh, at the Hunter Bellevue School of Nursing in New York City. Her most recent degree is PhD in Nursing at the Graduate Center Dr. Barroso is a certified infection control training trainer at the uh, State Department of Health. Dr. Barroso has 30 years of experience in public health, both internationally and nationally. 26 years of experience in conducting trainings, planning, organizing, coordinating educational activities for the Bureau of Tuberculosis Control, and 12 years of experience in teaching in nursing school. She's an adjunct faculty at Borough of Manhattan College, uh, Community College, Hunter Bellevue School of Nursing, and NYU College of Nursing. Without further ado, Dr. Barroso. Her presentation is Infection Control and Prevention of COVID-19. Dr. Barroso. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm LB Barroso from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I would like to thank the Filipino organizers for giving me this opportunity I hope this webinar will help Filipino Americans get more informed about COVID-19 virus. I would like to start with a disclaimer since our understanding of this COVID-19 is rapidly evolving. This presentation is based on CDC guidelines and health department recommendations as of today, April 25th, 2020. COVID-19 is an infectious and deadly virus that originated from animals. It is fairly new and we don't know a lot of things about this virus. Though we know that it can be transmitted from person to person via a respiratory droplet. The incubation period is between two to 14 days, which means symptoms can appear in just two days or may take two weeks for symptoms to appear after getting exposed. About 25% are asymptomatic who do not show symptoms but can transmit the virus. That's why wearing a mask is a sensible approach and a responsible act to help others not to get infected with COVID-19. Majority affects 50 years old and above when the immunity system starts to slow down. That makes them vulnerable to the virus. Males are disproportionately affected compared to females, which can be attributed to males having a lesser degree of immune response than females. And some experts says because of the two X chromosomes that give additional protection to females. Minority groups are also disproportionately affected. Black and Hispanic Americans were hospitalized at higher rates due to underlying medical conditions. According to data, African Americans have lower rates of being insured and lower median household incomes, which can limit access to health care. The treatment for COVID is supported. This refers to relieving the symptoms, helping them breathe, delivering intravenous fluids, keeping their fever down. 
most proposed treatments are still undergoing clinical trials. There's no proven safe or effective treatment at this time. When it comes to vaccine development, we are on phase one clinical trials, and it will take about 12 to 18 months before it's implemented. Advice to healthcare worker. All healthcare workers must act as if they've been potentially exposed to COVID-19, must do self-monitoring of temperature daily, must maintain social distance at least six feet from others, and must continue to do precautionary measures such as hand hygiene, wash hands after blowing nose, coughing, sneezing, after using bathroom, before eating or preparing food, after touching pets, or after taking care of family that needs care. Soap dissolves the fat membrane, which is the lipid bilayer. It makes the virus fall apart and become inactive. Cover cough and sneeze with a tissue or sleeve to prevent the spread of COVID. Immediately throw the tissue and wash hands. Personal hygiene has not been listed as part of the recommendation, but in my opinion, taking a shower or when you get home from hospital work gives you a, a peace of mind that you washed up all germs that you can possibly expose from work. While leaving home for work, items like watches and jewelries stay home. Other important items such as personal hygiene items, medicine, cell phone, credit card, photo ID goes into a Ziploc bag. Then you can put all items in an extra size plastic bag, or you can put all items in a car box if you travel by car. Wear closed shoes to protect any cracks in the skin from being infected or protect you from bringing germs to your house. Take a full water bottle that is handy for your own use and bring an extra size plastic bag and gloves in case you need them. To avoid bringing COVID-19 home, when you come back home from outside, if you travel by car, get your items out of your car box. Remove your shoes and leave at the door of your house. Leave your plastic bag with all items at the door until you get a chance to wipe or clean them one at a time with a sanitizer or wash them with soap and water. Have a clean spot to place each one after cleaning. No hugs to your loved ones when you get home. You need to keep distance from other members of household, again, at least six feet. And you must wash your hands thoroughly for 20 seconds. If you travel by car, go back to the car and clean the car. Wipe door handles, steering wheel, gear shift, seat belts, and any surfaces you may have touched. Clean the car box too. Wash hands again when you go back inside the house to take a shower, most especially if you are coming from your hospital work. And last, put all your clothes in a laundry bag. Create a household plan of action. Meet and educate members of your household on how COVID-19 is transmitted and how it can easily spread among members of household and community. Discuss the needs of each person, most especially the vulnerable members of the family. If you have grandparents living with you or any members of your family with severe chronic condition, they are at greater risk of complications if infected with COVID. Know how to protect and support the children in your care. Plan on where you can leave the small kids if somebody in the family is infected with COVID. And find ways to cope with stress that will make you and your loved ones and your community stronger. Stay informed and in touch. Get up-to-date information about COVID-19 from public health officials, CDC, WHO, and health department. Get informed about evidence-based information and be aware of false information. Communicate and collaborate with public health authorities if you need healthcare services. Create an emergency contact list of family and friends that you can reach out. For real-time updates, text COVID to 692692. If you feel anxious or overwhelmed, call 888-692-9388, or you can text WELL to 65173 or chat online at nyc.gov slash nycwell. For general questions, call 311. And for provider hotline, call 347-396-7940 or 866-692-3641.
Routine cleaning and disinfecting of households. Cleaning removes germs, dirt, and impurities from surfaces or objects. Routine cleaning of frequently touched surfaces such as tables, doorknobs, light switches, phones, handles, desks, toilet, faucets, sinks, and electronics with household cleaners appropriate for surfaces. Sanitizer reduces germs on surfaces to levels considered safe. Sanitizer must also be EPA registered. To prepare a cleaning solution, you can put five tablespoons bleach per gallon of water or four teaspoons bleach per quart of water. Disinfecting destroys almost all infectious germs and viruses. Disinfectants must be EPA registered. Examples of safer disinfectants are ethanol, isopropyl alcohol 70%, hydrogen peroxide, and lactic acid, and citric acid. Wear gloves when cleaning and disinfecting surfaces. Clean hands immediately after gloves are removed. Clean and disinfect bathroom as often as possible. If you are healthcare workers sick with COVID-19, stay home at least seven days since symptoms started. Monitor temperature daily and symptoms carefully. It is better to stay home if you have mild symptoms. If your symptoms get worse, Call your healthcare provider immediately and follow instructions from your healthcare provider. Get rest, stay hydrated, support your immune system by eating nutritious food, and do some breathing exercise. Cover your cough and sneezes with a tissue paper, then throw the tissue in the trash. Wash your hands often with soap and water at least 20 seconds, or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with 60% alcohol. Stay in specific room and away from other members of household, including pets. Use a face mask when leaving the room to prevent the spread of the virus. Avoid sharing personal items with other members like dishes, towels, toothpaste, and beddings. And let someone clean surfaces that are touched and to clean the bathroom after use. Do not have visitors come to your home. If you don't have space in your home for isolation. Request from your employer if they have provisions or accommodations for self-isolation. Or you can contact the City of New York COVID-19 hotel program by emailing hotels at oem.nyc.gov or visit nyc.gov slash COVID-19 hotel to reserve a free hotel room. This program provides healthcare workers such as physicians, nurses, home health aides, social workers, maintenance staff, food service, a place to stay to reduce the spread of COVID-19. You are eligible if you are employed or volunteering to provide care and or provide services in a healthcare community-based setting within New York City and may not be able to temporarily leave at home in order to minimize exposure. Rooms will be reserved up to 28 days. If you are not a healthcare worker and do not have a room for self-isolation, call 311. If you are coming out of the hospital and do not have a room at home for self-isolation, discuss with a hospital point person or social worker before discharge. When to seek medical attention. If you develop any of these emergency warning signs for COVID-19, get medical attention immediately. When you have trouble breathing, persistent, pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion or inability to arouse, bluish lips or face. This list is not all inclusive. Please consult your medical provider for any other symptoms that are severe or concerning to you. When you go to see your medical provider, wear a face mask. If possible, take a private car, sit in the back seat and roll down the window. If you have medical emergencies such as having more severe symptoms like difficulty of breathing and very high fever, call 911. Notify the operator that you have or think you might have COVID-19. And if possible, put on a cloth face covering before medical help arrives. How to discontinue home isolation? If you will have a test to determine if you are still contagious, you can leave home after you no longer have a fever without the use of fever reducing medications and respiratory symptoms of cough and shortness of breath that have improved. 
and two negative results in a row of an FDA emergency use authorized molecular assay for COVID-19 from at least two consecutive nasopharyngeal swab specimen collected 24 hours apart. As of today, saliva test has been approved aside from the nasopharyngeal swab. But take note, the New York City Department of Health does not require, does not require the third criteria of a negative test result. If you will not have a test to determine if you are still contagious, you can leave home after having these three criteria. You have had no fever for at least three full days or 72 hours of no fever without the use of fever reducing medications and respiratory symptoms of cough and shortness of breath have improved and at least seven days have passed since symptoms first appeared. So this means you have to stay home at least for seven days after symptoms started and three days after your fever stopped without the use of fever reducing medications so a total of 10 days before you can leave home. In all cases, follow the guidelines of your healthcare provider and local health departments. Healthcare worker with laboratory confirmed COVID-19 who have not had any symptoms should be excluded from work until 10 days have passed since the date of the first COVID positive diagnostic test assuming that they have not subsequently developed symptoms since their positive test. If health, if healthcare worker had COVID-19 ruled out and have an alternative diagnosis, for example, tested positive for influenza, criteria for return to work should be based on that diagnosis. Return to work practices and work restrictions. Healthcare worker must wear a face mask for source control at all times while in the healthcare facility until all symptoms are completely resolved or until 14 days after illness onset, whichever is longer. After this time period, healthcare workers should revert to their facility policy regarding universal source control during the pandemic. Healthcare workers must be restricted from contact with severely immunocompromised patients, for example, transplant and hematology oncology patients until 14 days after illness onset. Self-monitor for symptoms and seek re-evaluation from occupational health if respiratory symptoms recur or worsen. Outside of New York City, check with your employer before returning to work. Plans to fight COVID-19. We do the COVID test to detect the virus, and now we have the antibody test or IG. This tells us if those who had been sick of COVID develop antibodies. The antibody test will, tell, will identify two types of coronavirus antibody molecules. The immunoglobulin M, which tell us current infection, or immunoglobulin G, which is a past infection. But it has not been proven yet if those that develop antibodies develop protective immunity. However, having knowledge of those who develop antibodies recovered from illness and has IgG can help us determine who could return to work safely. Antibody testing is now available to healthcare workers, essential workers, and four hospitals, Bellevue, Montefiore, Elmhurst, and the SUNY Downstate Hospital. Contact tracing can be done to identify those circle of individuals who have been exposed to a case of COVID-19. We need to isolate sick people and quarantine to separate those exposed who don't show symptoms to see if they become sick. These are the Filipino organizations you can call to get some help. We must continue to work together to contain this COVID-19 virus. Stay home to save lives. And we must continue praying, and we will get through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barroso. We now go to the question and answer um, section of the presentation. Uh, first, I want to get questions from our uh, organizers, panelists. Um, maybe we have a question from uh, Marie, Dr. Marie Ortaliz. Uh, uh, we can hear you, Dr. Ortelis. Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 All right. Uh, my question is for Dr. Santos. 
Uh, patients with COVID-19, when they deteriorate, they often desaturate and they're given uh, oxygen. So high, we know that high dose oxygen concentration delivered to these patients can lead to toxicity manifested by atelectasis. So how much, my question is, how much oxygen can be considered too much when a patient is on a ventilator? Well, the way we uh, manage intubated patients is for this particular COVID-19 pneumonias, there has been, they have detected two different types of lung pathologies. There's one subset of patients that they have, uh, that they have, uh, a loss of alveolar compliance and recruitment, and they have a ventilation perfusion mismatch. And because of this, they have a failure of alveolar dis uh, distension and would need mechanical ventilation with high PEEP and a higher FiO2. So this is different. This is a different subset of patients that they have lost uh, alveolar compliance and recruitment. So it would be safe in this particular set of patients to give as high oxygen as possible because their lungs are really, their alveoli are collapsed. There is a second subset of patients though that they have not lost their alveolar compliance, their lungs are pretty compliant, and what happens is they have hypoxic vasoconstriction. And in this particular set of people, the ventilation perfusion mismatch is because of hypoxic vasoconstriction. There's a lot of blood flow, but there is no oxygen. And in this particular case, what is recommended is more is for more for non-invasive ventilation in the forms of CPAP or BiPAP. Now we were asking what would be oxygen toxicity? Of course, high oxygen would be toxic to the lungs, but Mechanically intubated patients, of course, they are monitored, their oxygen levels are monitored, their CO2 levels are monitored, and as much as possible, we try to give them the lowest FiO2 or oxygen level possible. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Barossa. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Garcia. Yes. Um, this question is for um, Dr. L.V. Barroso. Dr. Barroso, children do not appear to be at higher risk for COVID-19 than adults. Adults make up most of the known cases today. What happens if both parents are sick with COVID-19? Since children may only show mild symptoms or signs of the disease, what are the warning signs that would alert the parents to bring the children to the hospital? Thank you, that is a very good question. Again, that's why we need to plan ahead on when we can, where we can leave the small kids if somebody in the family is infected with COVID and have an emergency contact list of family and friends that we can reach out Although kids can develop the same symptoms as adults, the warning signs that should alert parents to bring children to hospital would be high fever, cough, and difficulty of breathing. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Emerson Ia Kalusugan. First of all, thank you, Dr. Barroso, and thank you, Dr. Santos, for those um, informative um, presentation. Just very, very quickly, you know, we focus more so on the cardiopulmonary symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, could you share some insights about the non-cardio respiratory symptoms associated with COVID? Because there's evidence that about up to 40% of patients manifest um, GI symptoms, just diarrhea. So if you could maybe weigh in on, uh, on the implications of this um, physiologically and uh, infection control uh, purposes? Uh, the, uh, the respiratory virus would attach to the ACE2 receptors in the body. And ACE2 receptors, we have a lot of ACE2 receptors in the gastrointestinal tract. And that's why most likely patients infected with COVID-19 will have symptoms referable to the GI tract, such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So the implication is 
uh, will they be infected or fecal samples? Will they be shedding a viral RNA in their, fe in their feces? That is a question. Because yes, it has been noted in certain uh, uh, fecal specimens that viral RNA of COVID-19 is present. So there's going to be manifestations of gastrointestinal tract based on the, the gastrointestinal tract having a lot of what we call those H2 receptors, angiotensin converting enzyme to receptors. So that will be a question too as far as like, you know, transmission and uh, contagiousness. And I guess that's where disinfectant gets in, you know, cleaning the toilets very well uh, because of possible fecal uh, contamination and transmission. Yeah, I just want to add, since uh, diarrhea is the most common GI symptoms, so after a patient uses the bathroom, uh, is it advised to uh, do contact precaution and the use of personal protective equipment when, um, when somebody uh, is cleaning that bathroom? All right, thank you. Uh, another question from um, Dr. Razon. Do you have a question for the uh, presenters? Hi, yes. Uh, this question can be for uh, either one of our guest speakers, but uh, could either one of you comment on the virus's uh, contagiousness? So are there unique aspects of the virus structure that contributes to its virulence, or are there aspects of the environment that affects its contagiousness that has been different than what has been observed in previous respiratory infections? The uh, the COVID nineteen virus, uh, the its pathogenic its pathogenicity lies in its spike the the S protein, and also in its envelope because the envelope protein is the one responsible for its uh, replication and uh, assembly or for virus replication. Most of the experiments or studies have been shown with the SARS coronavirus, the one that happened in 2003. As far as like uh, virulence, again, studies, initial reports have shown that the virulence could have come from that S or the spike glycoprotein and also the envelope protein or the, uh, the envelope protein, those two particular types of the, uh, of the, uh, of the virus or the virion. All right. Um, thank, thank you for the... Yeah, and, um, oh, I just want to add to that one also, that uh, we will not overcome this virus unless we have collective consciousness, which means that we have the same ideas, attitudes, and knowledge to fight this COVID-19 virus. All right, thank you. Um, now, um, Dr. Emerson, we have uh, questions from the chat box. Uh, from those attending? Yes, so first of all, uh, we would like to acknowledge the many responses that we've seen at the chat box. Um, one question was from, is from uh, Don Tagala, who was asking about information that relates to the effectiveness of treatment. So although this presentation is all about pathogenesis and infection control, uh, please go ahead and ask your question and maybe our uh, guest speakers could weigh in as to what's the current evidence of that. Um, let me read it. Um, from the chat box, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, TB vaccine, convalescent, um, plasma serum, plasma, monoclonal antibodies, and recently President Trump mentioned sunlight, UV light, and even disinfectants to be injected into your body to kill the coronavirus. Don Tagala from ABSC and asks, so when it comes to cure or treatment, how should we take this information? and which of them is the most promising thus far? Let me answer that question. As of the moment, uh, there are really no recommendations yet because nothing, we don't have any randomized controlled trials for any of the antiviral medications such as remdesivir or even hydroxychloroquine by itself or hydroxychloroquine in combination with azithromycin. We have tried also a plasma convalescent serum, again, these are all investigational. As far as this heat, uh, which has an, a dis heat disinfectant that has recently been uh, mentioned, again, we don't have any studies uh, to prove that they work. 
So as of the moment, we really, we really have no specific antiviral treatment for COVID-19. There is no vaccine currently available, and treatment is completely symptomatic. And oxygen therapy represents the major treatment intervention for patients with severe infection. All right, thank you. Now, a question from the Facebook uh, page of the consulate. Uh, the question is uh, from Carol Tanhutko. Nurses from out of state who wish to work in New York City, but they have no place to stay. Who do they need to contact? Uh, I think that's question is for Dr. Barroso. Yeah, uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, they can call. Let me let me go back to the. Uh, uh, um, so probably I just have to tell them, um, you know, later on, you know, the 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 person or the agency that they need to contact regarding. Uh, yeah, they their... can contact the New York City um, hotel, in the New York City COVID nineteen hotel program. Okay. By again, yeah, emailing hotels at oem.nyc.gov. Okay. All right. Is there another question from the chat box, um, Dr. Emerson? Yes, this is from Bobby Dalton. I don't know if you are online, if you can ask your question that relates to comorbidities associated with COVID-19. Hi, thank you so much for having this. Um, I wanted to know about any additional comorbidities that are related to um, COVID-19, such as diabetes, uh, cancer, smoking, vaping, those kind of uh, those kind of comorbid morbidities. Well, comorbidities that we have seen in patients would include, of course, essential hypertension, diabetes mellitus, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and of course, you mentioned cancer patients and immunosuppressive treatments. Uh, Basically, you know, that's, are the, the, that's, those are the most common comorbidities that we have that we have seen. All right, thank you. Um, the question from the Facebook page: um, If we have a documented ARDS with really stiff lungs, are we not supposed to give higher FiO2, but with minimal tidal volume? I guess this is a technical. Uh, question regarding uh, ventilator settings uh, directed to Dr. Santos. Yes, um, we really recommend low tidal uh, ventilation in patients. That means we try to give less uh, ventilation and the amount of ventilation given is about six cc's or six milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So. What that means is we do not want to overventilate the lungs because if we overventilate the lungs, this would lead to over distension and over distension may cause more lung injury from you know the high pressure or also what we call pulmonary barotrauma. So we try to give as low a ventilation as possible and even allowing some form of what we call hypercapnia. You know, that means that there may be a little bit of a higher carbon dioxide production, but you don't want the lungs to become over distended. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Santos. I think that ends the question and answer um, uh, section of our presentation. Um, be, be, before we, uh, there, I, there are a few more questions. We will, ask the, uh, we will answer them uh, uh, through the, um, you know, the Filipino American Health Forum uh, um, email. Um, before we leave, uh, thank you, Dr. Barroso, and thank you, Dr. Santos, for the presentations. Um, we want to hear from the Consul General before we leave, and then Dr. Marie will uh, say something, and Dr. Uh, Laura will say something. So uh, before we end, um, we'd like to hear from the Consul General, uh, Claro Cristobal. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rivera. And we thank uh, Dr. Santos, Dr. Barroso. You've been so very helpful. Uh, I'm no doctor. Many of the words you use, I would never hope to understand. But the general tenor 
of the information you have been uh, sharing with us and with our viewers have been most appreciated. Let me just inform you that uh, not only have we reached our Kababayans from New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, we have viewers from the United Kingdom, from Saudi Arabia, from Bermuda. We're reaching our Kababayans uh, in very many parts of the world. And uh, I would like to invite our uh, viewers to invite our community to tune in next Saturday uh, for our next health forum. Thank you all so very much. Uh, thank you, um, Ambassador uh, Cristobal. Now we have a few words from Dr. Marie Ortaliz. Dr. Ortaliz. Thank you, Dr. Romel Rivera, and also our organizers and also our speakers, Dr. Barroso and Dr. Santos. I just want to announce that the next succeeding or the succeeding topics will be mental health amidst COVID-19 pandemic scheduled for May 2nd and xenophobia and racism amidst COVID-19 scheduled for May 9. And other topics to be decided are being solicited from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ortaliz. And now uh, closing remarks from Dr. Laura Garcia. Hi, thank you all for joining, for joining the second of several series of the M Health Forum. Got feedback? We love to hear from you. Please send us your comments, suggestions, and how we can improve our forum, and most importantly, future topics that you would like to hear. And email us at phil.m.health.forum at gmail.com. And follow us at hashtag PhilAmHealth COVID-19. Thank you and see you next time. Be well and stay safe. All right, thank you very much uh, for our audiences. Uh, hope to see you next week uh, for the Mental Health Forum amidst COVID-19. Thank you all.